Jack Goralnik completed his MD degree in 1971 at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and practiced as a physician for over a decade before completing graduate degrees in public health at the University of California at Berkeley. From there he began a research career at the National Institute on Aging where he served as chief of the Intramural Laboratory of Epidemiology, Demography, and Biometry and focused on physical functioning and disability as part of the aging process. He retired from NIH in 2010 and serves part-time on the medical faculty at the University of Maryland. Machiko Yanagishita received a Master of Arts degree from Georgetown University and worked at the National Institute on Aging in the 1980s, where she co-authored this article with Dr. Goralnik. She eventually moved to the Population Council in New York City and then to the Population Council's office in Japan. She is now an Associate Professor of Demography and Gender Studies at Josei University in Japan. This article from 30 years ago still is important today because it examines how progress in life expectancy advances differently in different countries. It is an early contribution to the ongoing effort to understand why and how Japan has become the country where people live longer than anywhere else in the world. One of the things that attracted me to the study of population was that, unlike many of the concepts described and measured by other social sciences, Demographers apparently dealt with things that were more solid and reliable, things that you could measure clearly. While people argue on and on about how to define things like political party affiliation or gender identity or the famous tastes and preferences that economists use to package up everything they don't want to measure at the moment, it seemed that a birth was a birth, a death was a death. And yet, even describing the pattern of vital events like deaths or births can become quite complicated when you step back and try to study an entire population rather than one individual at a time. We see this when Yanagishita and Goralnik compare mortality rates and trends in Sweden and Japan. For example, different people die at different ages. Some die almost immediately after they're born. Other people, like my mother, live to be a hundred years old. And in demography, just like in vaudeville, Timing is everything. When we begin to study thousands or even millions of people, we need to find some shorthand way to describe patterns in the timing of all those deaths. The measure you will find mentioned most often, both by experts like Yanagishita and Goralnik, and by people like journalists who often have only a faint idea what it actually means, is expectation of life or life expectancy at birth. The term expectation has a precise meaning in statistics. The expectation of a whole group of numbers is simply the mean of those numbers. Expectation of life is the mean age at death in a population, the mean age to which a person can expect to live once he or she has been born. Verse 9 of the first chapter in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes declares that there is nothing new under the sun. When we take a close look at human populations, though, what has been in the past is no longer what we see in the present day. Specifically, life expectancy has been increasing dramatically over the last century or two, something that was never seen under the sun before. The age to which you can expect to live once you are born has increased by several decades in just that historical blink of an eye. As this cartoon shows, many people don't understand the average meaning for life expectancy. When they hear that life expectancy once was as low as 30 or 40 years of age, they mistakenly jump to the conclusion that everybody was dead by that age, or at least that lots of people were dying at about that age. Both of these impressions are wrong. If life expectancy is 30 years on average, lots of people must be dying at ages well above 30, to balance out the people who died at ages below 30, since it is an average measure. The other big problem with understanding life expectancy as a measure is that the risk of death varies tremendously from one age to another. If we know that the mean age at death in a population is age 60, for example, that tells us nothing about when different individuals die. It is only the average, and averages conceal variations in the individual cases that are being averaged. Indeed, that is the whole purpose of a mean or a median as an average measure, 
to summarize a lot of information in a single number. But inevitably, we lose important details when we calculate an average. It is like saying that on average a stream is one foot deep, and therefore it is no problem for me to walk across until my hat floats. When we look at human populations, the risk of death forms a U-shaped curve with higher risks at the youngest and the oldest ages and very low risks of death among young adults. If many people in high school and college seem to think that they're immortal and indestructible, well, compared to other ages, they're actually not far wrong. This age pattern appears in every population, whether death rates are high or low. If we look at two different populations, one with high death rates and low life expectancy, and the other with low death rates and high life expectancy, we can see the same U-shaped pattern. This means that there are only two times in life when we can make really dramatic progress in lowering death rates. We can save lives of infants and little children, or we can save lives of older people. In either case, there's room under the mortality curves in the figure shown here to bring death rates down and increase life expectancy. This brings us to the second important feature of deaths that varies from one person to another the reasons or causes why the person dies. A baby may die at birth if the umbilical cord gets caught around the neck and strangles circulation during or before delivery. A soldier may get blown up in Iraq by an improvised explosive device planted in the road. An old man may die of pneumonia after a long illness. Pneumonia actually has been called the old man's friend. For young adults, most causes of death are more remote. About the only things that will kill high school or college students is each other or themselves. The biggest risks they face occur at 2.30 a.m. in the parking lots of bars and nightclubs or going 85 miles an hour on two-lane highways in the dark. The difference between national populations with high and low life expectancies is much more predictable, though. The law of large numbers takes over. If the Greeks had known about the predictability that comes from the law of large numbers, they would have invented a god to represent it. And when human societies first began to understand diseases and make progress in preventing deaths, the first and easiest causes of death that they learned to control were contagious and parasitic diseases like those already illustrated by the McKinleys in the previous reading on the United States. These causes of death mainly killed infants and little children, so when death rates first began to fall in high mortality populations, they fell because people were preventing infant deaths from cholera, dysentery, whooping cough, yellow fever, and other contagious causes, the so-called childhood killers. When people don't die of these external causes, of course, they grow up, live longer lives, and usually die instead at older ages from heart attacks, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and other internal causes. Since death rates started falling first in Europe more than a century ago, European countries got a head start on the rest of the world in lower mortality and longer life expectancy. For a long time, Sweden was the champion of the world in terms of long lives. The Swedes recorded the longest life expectancy on Earth year after year throughout much of the 20th century. However, Yanagishita and Goralnik document a remarkable shift in these global patterns, as Japan suddenly made dramatic gains in life expectancy and actually passed Sweden during the 1970s to become the longest-lived population on Earth. By comparison, the United States lags well back in the pack of nations, about the same as Poland, Chile, and Costa Rica. They want to look more closely at this sudden change and to see how the age pattern of mortality and different causes of death may have played a part in the Japanese success. Although the earliest progress against uncontrolled mortality involved ways to control contagious and parasitic diseases discussed by the McKinleys, mainly saving the lives of infants and little children, both Sweden and Japan studied in this article had advanced well beyond that early stage of the demographic transition. They both had reduced infant and child mortality to very low levels so that nearly all of the men and women in both countries grew up and lived long, full lives. That is the only way to get a really high expectation of life, as found in both countries in the late 20th century. 
Both countries had shifted from communicable external causes of death to predominantly internal lifestyle causes of death, such as heart attacks, diabetes, stroke, cancer, and the other civilized killers familiar to us all today. Since we can only affect death rates enough among the youngest and oldest people in order to have a noticeable impact on life expectancy, Yanagishida and Goralnik hypothesized that Japan passed Sweden in the Global Life Expectancy Grand Prix race through progress that lowered death rates in later life. We extend their earlier research showing the crossover in life expectancy during the 1970s. In 1972, women in Sweden lived about a year and a half longer on average than women in Japan, 77.5 for Swedish women and 75.9 for Japanese women. Over the next 10 years leading up to 1982, the Swedes continued to make progress in the fight against mortality. Life expectancy for Swedish women increased by about two years, from 77.5 to 79.4. But during those same years, life expectancy for women in Japan jumped by almost four years, from 75.9 to 79.7. Once they passed Sweden, as we can see by these figures updated to 2012, the Japanese never looked back. They continued to pull farther and farther ahead of the Swedes in life expectancy, leading by more than two and a half years in 2012. Today, Japan's position as life expectancy champion of the world is well known. But at the time, this all came as quite a shock, especially to the Europeans, who had been used to thinking of themselves as automatically leading the pack in terms of demographic progress in the world. I well remember the conference of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population held in Florence, Italy in 1985. This is the International Association for Demographers, and that year one of the most talked about presentations was made by Dr. Shigemi Kono from the Japanese Ministry of Health in Tokyo. Dr. Kono gave a talk in which he shared the details of age patterns, causes of death, and other specifics documenting Japan's new status as life expectancy champion of the world. After his talk, it was time for lunch, and conference delegates scattered into the city to find nice little Italian restaurants. I made sure to tag along with the group containing Dr. Kono. We had real Italian pizza at a little trattoria not far from the conference center. It was just tomato sauce and cheese, no funny toppings like the Americans scatter all over their version of pizza. After a polite period for eating, we asked Dr. Kono how the Japanese had done it. What was their secret? He gave us his best, most inscrutable Japanese look and calmly told us, we eat the blue-skinned fish. Meaning, of course, that they ate fresh seafood instead of a lot of greasy sausages and fat beef and pork as loved by many people in Europe. I knew this was just a shorthand remark for a very complicated outcome, but I wasn't taking any chances. When I went back home to the United States, I ate a lot of blue-skinned fish, I can tell you. Raw tuna sashimi, you name it. At any rate, Yanagishida and Goralnik took the data being released by Japan, combined it with data from Sweden, and published this paper three years later in 1988. They use a complicated but commonly used statistical technique to take the total difference between two life expectancies, in this case the year and a half deficit by which Japan trailed Sweden in 1972, and break it down by age groups to show how differences in age-specific death rates at each age contributed to the overall deficit. In their figure 2, they show us age groups along the horizontal axis for little children at ages 0 to 4, then 10-year age groups up to 75, and an open-ended residual group of everybody over 75. For 1972, this figure shows that every age group contributed something to the total deficit, helping to produce Japan's lower life expectancy. This means that death rates were higher in Japan than in Sweden in every one of those age ranges. The difference in death rates of little children contributed two-tenths of a year to the total difference of a year and a half. The biggest contributors, though, were ages over 55, producing over half of the total deficit of a year and a half in just those three age ranges. 
When they look ahead to 1982, though, and did exactly the same calculations again, we see a very different result. The Japanese deficit of a year and a half of life expectancy suddenly reversed to a survival advantage of nearly a whole year ahead of Sweden. When we take apart that advantage to see the contributions of each age group, the results are even more clear and dramatic. At all ages under 25, Japanese death rates were still higher than death rates in Sweden, although they closed the gap a little bit. By themselves, these young ages would still have produced a life expectancy deficit for Japan. In middle adulthood, between 25 and 55, the death rates in Japan had been improving faster than in Sweden and actually were better in Japan by 1982 for ages between 25 and 44. But the really stunning results appear at ages over 55. At these older ages, very large deficits for Japan in 1972 have been erased completely and even replaced by very large advantages. In the 1982 picture, differences between Japan and Sweden at ages 25 to 55 pretty much cancel out differences from birth to age 25 so that the entire advantage of a year longer life expectancy came from the dramatic improvements in survival at the oldest ages. This is just what Yanagishida and Goralnik expected to find, since both countries had reduced infant and child mortality to such low levels already. Old age was just about the only place left to make big progress against death rates, and for some reason Japan made much more progress at these ages than did Sweden. In the final part of the lecture, we explore their explanations for how and why this faster progress in reducing death rates of older people happened in Japan. Building on their results showing that Japanese mortality fell faster than in Sweden, particularly at older ages, Yanagishita and Goralnik take the analysis one step further and break down the contributions from each age group into pieces traced to different causes of death. Their table 5 can be a little confusing, first because it's full of so many different numbers, but also because they're no longer comparing Japan and Sweden in this table. They're no longer talking about the difference in life expectancy between Japan and Sweden in a particular year like 1982. Instead, they're looking only at Japan in the two different years, first comparing 1972 to 1977, and then comparing 1977 to 1982 to give us two installments or periods of change in survival. The top half of the table looks at the change in death rates for Japanese men between 1972 and 1977, while the bottom half of the table looks at the change between 1977 and 1982. The first column of numbers on the left in this table shows the total gain in life expectancy labeled all ages. From 1972 to 1977, life expectancy increased by 2.2 years for men in Japan. From 1977 to 1982, it increased by another 1.5 years, or nearly 4 years total in the decade, as we already saw in an earlier figure. The all causes row of numbers across the top of each half of this table break down the total improvement into components that come from improvements against mortality in each of the age ranges shown. And once again, we can see that the biggest part of the gains in life expectancy came from ages between 55 and 74. This was true in both time periods. Particularly in the second five-year period in the bottom half of the table, if we combine the contributions of ages 55 to 74 and ages 75 or older, we capture most of the improvement in Japanese life expectancy. In the column beneath each age-specific contribution to the overall gains, the authors break down that age group's contribution into shares due to changes in different causes of death. Again, all the figures in each column of causes add up to the all causes total shown at the top of that column for that time period. Some of these cause-specific contributions show negative numbers. This means that death rates from such causes actually increased among Japanese men at those ages during the period in question. This is the case at ages 55 to 74, for example, for deaths from colorectal cancers between 1972 and 1975. 
and from other kinds of cancers from 1977 to 1982. So whatever the Japanese were doing to gain life expectancy, it was not curing cancer. Lung cancer mortality increased in both time periods for most adult age groups, and this is not surprising given how much so many men in Japan were smoking cigarettes at this time. Yanagishida and Goralnik traced the biggest changes in life expectancy for Japanese men to great improvements in death rates from diseases of the circulatory system. Not so much heart attacks, but rather cerebrovascular diseases, the events that we commonly call strokes. There are two quite different types of strokes. First, the blood vessels in the brain may become blocked with plaques, and blood flow may be reduced or even blocked to certain areas of the brain downstream from the blockage. Without oxygen-rich blood, these brain cells die, as they did for my uncle, who lost the ability to talk or to use his right arm from a stroke. Second, the blood vessels in the brain may become weakened and develop structural flaws that cause them to bubble out under the pressure of the blood flow, and in some cases even rupture and burst, releasing blood into the brain cavity and again killing brain cells that no longer receive the blood flow. Somehow, the Japanese were preventing strokes in older men with terrific success, so much so that older men in Japan started to survive in much greater numbers. These older men not having strokes are the main reason that life expectancy in Japan surged ahead and passed Sweden during these decades. Though Yanagashida and Goralnik have opened up the statistical details and give us a clear picture of the ages and causes of death involved in Japan's success, this certainly is not the end of the mystery. Was it all about a blue-skinned fish? How did they do it? What was the secret of their rapid reductions in stroke mortality among older Japanese men? Health experts still today tell us that cardiovascular health in general can be greatly improved if people remain active, continuing to get regular exercise as they get older instead of becoming sedentary and inactive. Another major contributor to strokes, or to avoiding them, has been traced to differences in diet. Probably everyone knows a close friend or relative who sits down at the table, grabs the salt shaker, and starts shaking salt on all their food before even tasting it. Hopefully you are not one of these people yourself, because a diet high in salt is well recognized as a major contributor to problems with those blood vessels in your brain and to stroke deaths. The traditional Japanese diet, like traditional diets in many parts of the world, has featured a lot of salt. Popular sauces like soy sauce traditionally contain huge amounts of salt. All over the world, historically, the way to keep perishable food like meat and vegetables from spoiling used salt as a preservative. Salted meat and pickled vegetables were staple items of diets in many cultures. A hundred years ago, if you present a table with fresh vegetables and pickled vegetables, people all over the world were likely to go for the pickles every time because they had learned that the pickled items would not be spoiled or bad. Yanagishida and Goralnik document a rapid shift in Japanese diet in the decades after the Second World War, with the introduction of a more Western style of food with much lower salt content. They view this dietary change as a major factor in lower stroke deaths. Of course, this same change may account for some of the counteracting increases observed in Table 5 for colorectal cancer, but the net result was rapid gains in life expectancy. Other logical possibilities for rising life expectancy in Japan might include effective preventive health care, but this is not likely to be an explanation for different trends in Japan and Sweden because both countries had highly developed universal health care systems both then and now. This article documents an important shift in survival chances as Japan became the longest lived population in the world and the authors give primary importance to changes in diet. But there is one last feature of this shift to consider. What do we see if we extend this picture beyond 1982, beyond the decade where the crossover in life expectancy took place? These last pictures repeat the age decomposition that Yanagishida and Goralnik calculated for 1972 and 1982. For women, we see the 1972 Japanese deficit in red, with all ages contributing to lower life expectancy in Japan. For 1982, we repeat their findings that show gains in life expectancy, 
producing a surplus for Japan at ages between 55 and 75. In 1992, 2002, and 2012, these surpluses continue to expand for Japanese women as their survival advantage continues to expand after age 50, reaching higher in each decade. It is clearly an old age phenomenon and getting older all the time. For men, the picture is not quite the same as for women. We see the same 1972 deficit for Japan, and by 1982 we see again that the ages from 55 to 75 produce much bigger improvements in Japan than in Sweden and push total Japanese life expectancy ahead of that for Sweden. But this big advantage for Japanese men does not sit still at one particular age range as we move forward to 1992, 2002, and 2012. In each decade, the advantage for men shifts to the right, to older ages, in fact, to ages about 10 years older every 10 years. This suggests a completely different possible explanation for the survival advantage of Japanese men, an explanation that never occurred to Yanagishida and Goralnik, and that to my knowledge has never been explored in detail in published research. It looks suspiciously like there is a special generation of men, either in Japan or possibly in Sweden instead, that is different from earlier or later generations. In 1972, they are about 50 years old, so that the Japanese survival deficit is smaller at that age than at younger or older ages. By 1982, they are 60 years old, and they show up instead as a peak in Japan's new survival advantage. This peak shifts 10 years to the right every 10 years following the same group of men. Either the men born in Japan around 1920 are unusually healthy compared to generations that came before them or after them, or the men born in Sweden around 1920 are unusually unhealthy compared to the generations that came before them or after them in Sweden. Perhaps somebody will investigate this apparent cohort pattern one day, and we'll have a new article to read.